Now, in economics, this is quite different. Because what are the objects involved? Well, you, know, you can talk about groups <coughs> such as class, class, social classes, <coughs> the capitalist class, the landowner class, the the uh, workers, skilled and unskilled, etc. But then you can also talk about other groups, such as religious. Oh, even before that, you can call, talk about national nations and many others. And you can keep increasing the number of these groups, but ultimately the indivisible object is still an animate object, is the individual. And that's where it stops. It never stops here, but it stops there. Because once you try to subdivide the individual, you are dealing with dead bodies, right? <laughs> so that's the end. If you want, and these are animate, as opposed to inanimate, we are talking about animate. So, Free will is characteristic, but nowhere more than in the individual. By the way, Protestantism brought up that issue. Does the individual have free will? And there were wars, religious wars fought over that issue. Thousands or even hundreds of thousands of people die in defense of one or the other extreme. Some groups, the Protestants, especially the, I think the Calvinists, insisted that there was no free will. Instead, there was predestination. On the moment as individual is born, his or her fate is written. There's nothing the individual can do. He will either succeed in going to heaven or going to hell. Now, we are not entering that. I'm just uh, trying to indicate that this is not as obvious as it may look. But for the purposes of the science of economics, this is absolutely important to see that the elementary particles are not infinitely divisible because it stops at the individual, at the level of the individual. And that's how subjective economics That's the world view embraced by subjective economics. Now these are the thoughts I wanted to add to, as I say, this is a little deviating from the title because this comes up after Menger and this is before, basically before Menger. Let me just add a little funny thought. Because at the time, this subjective economics was developed, the time when Menger lived and worked, a particular market has very great importance. And that was the horse market, because we are before the 
advent of the passenger car. So people who wanted to have mobility, they either had to learn to ride a horse or they had to have a carriage and put horses, a team of horses before, and that's how they traveled. So the horse market was absolutely important, just as important as the car market is today. Today still we have horse market, but this is nothing else in comparison with what it used to be in the 19th century. Now, there was another horse market, and that was the horse meat market, because horse meat was a basic staple food, for especially for the poor strata of population, horse meat. So the big difference between these two markets was divisibility. <laughs> the horse meat you could slice and dice and chop to any small amount of the horse market. You cannot, because you have to stop with the one horse. If you try to stop there, then it's a dead horse ready for consumption or whatever other purposes you can use a dead horse. But a big difference. Now this is the difference which is being ignored by modern economics. And you would only have to go as far back as the 19th century to see the two horse markets. The market for live horses and the market for dead or, or the horse meat market. But that's completely forgotten. And of course, more important is the distinction between subjective economics and this is popularly called macroeconomics, when you are looking at causality, and this is microeconomics, where you recognize the role of the subject, of the individual, and the fact that individuals have ultimate ends, and they pick means, choose means, to achieve that. So there's a unity. You see the unity as opposed to the contrast, to the dialectic between teleology and axiology. So this is the thought I would like to leave with you, that this is an absolute revolution, and it's hardly recognized today. Certainly if you go to university, they never tell you about this. But without this, you just don't understand what economics is about. No, I, I'm finished. So, but if you could have a little discussion on that, yeah. I think. I think, so with my example, I said that um, a wish to be sedentary is an end. So the operative word there is wish. Wish is a, a, a mental thing. But the ultimate, uh, for, uh, no, you don't, okay. Talk about the, uh, the Macintosh and hat, okay? A wish to wear a Macintosh and hat is, is, is an end, but the, the higher, the ultimate end behind that is not to catch a cold and die, you know? So even that has an ultimate end. So the key operative there was the word wish that made it an end as far as I was concerned because a wish is a mental, um, a mental process. So, um, do we have any more questions on the back of what Professor was talking about there? The set of ultimate ends must be much smaller than the set of um, intermediary ends. And that set has to be much smaller than the praxeological sort of the methods by which you, do, you, 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 you enact those ends, basically. So you all come sort of to a point, and that's sort of your ultimate ends, whatever they might be out I, there. I could conclude that statistics comes or looks for causality 
whereas we should be looking for purposes. And that is the message that I would like to, for you to uh, take home with this. I think it's lunchtime. No? It is. It is lunchtime. So uh, we'll have one and a half hours for lunch. Um, uh,